perspective. Yep. What's up, everybody? How are we doing today? We're doing really good. How's that? Sound good? It's a fun day of excitement. Super nice. fun day of excitement. Yeah. I was... Well, we just had like another show we just picked up off of uh, what was it, Jeffrey Warnick? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Well, welcome back to Dev Wednesdays, and today we are doing Rust. Uh, what was that article you just posted in chat? Uh, Forbes magazine. Um, okay, that's like a good kickoff. Actually, let's 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 uh let's do a little quick read. Yeah, this is this is for anyone who doesn't know what Rust is, and they're like, "Why should I care about another programming language?" That's something that I think about all the time because I'm like, "Oh, because Java, have... JavaScript can do everything." <laughs> JavaScript can do everything. That's funny. So, okay, so what's the? Um, we don't want to read directly from you know Forbes, but basically, really, what it comes down to is that uh. Google engineers have revealed unsafe code within Chrome is responsible for 70% of its security vulnerabilities. It's like, uh, it's like basically expanding on it. Microsoft is already working on improving C and C++ code in its Chromium-based Edge browser with Project Verona, inspired by Rust. Speaking with ZDNet earlier this week, Microsoft said C and C++ would have reached a wall, and we really can't do much what we have already have. It's becoming harder and harder and more and more costly to address these issues over time. But we need to look at the industry to see what the best alternative to C++ is. And it turns out a language called Rust. I'm not seeing us on YouTube, guys. Are we on YouTube? Are we on YouTube? Could be. Probably. Hopefully. Hopefully a free stream is working. And we lost him. Goodbye, Adam. But anyway, that's intense. Yeah, uh, which is, which is a perfect uh, reason to why we are choosing Rust, not just because we are jumping on the bandwagon, but we be, we can actually see just on like surface level, like something that came on uh, to me immediately was like, okay, uh, what if C plus plus had like a package manager? of like code that was already a part of like a larger movement and uh rust has something like that yes which is kind of cool because a lot i would say a lot of code that you would have in like a c plus plus environment is pretty much you know unless you have it on github pretty much like a, a a a very held secret to whatever companies are de developing for it. So it's not like there's a great consensus on how the, you know, on, I guess like memory management. I think that when I was looking at uh, jobs for C++, because it's one of my interests, it, you know, memory management is the hot topic. Do you agree? Yes. That's the primary topic of the article. In fact. Okay. Yeah. What's up? Well, if you read through the entire thing, basically the issue is that even the almighty Google cannot handle the memory management issues inherent in C++. And that is what contributes to the vul vulnerabilities, things like buffer overflow attacks. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the package manager is cool in Rust, and it's one of the best features. But the, the ultimate feature is that rust has safe memory management so I, i'd it like to get prevents all the errors people make when coding c plus plus built into the language itself can i what? give some historical context to this actually so there is a brazil has a space program i believe i think it's brazil and it was one of the south american countries it may have been brazil i'm fairly certain it was anyways long story short they launched a rocket and they didn't allocate for enough memory bandwidth on one of their rockets and it caused and triggered an error and it blew up. So like a, <laughs> like a $200 million mission, I think it was written in actually C++ and they didn't like adjust for the variable and it caused a, uh, 
you know, either what, what's the what's the result code that you usually get back? What is it? Um, not undefined. It's uh, uh, I forget. Anyways, long story short is that the rocket actually crashed. So memory is like a serious issue in every like applications. Mozilla Firefox had a had a bug once. And it was like basically to you leaving open a dynamically allocated array. There's all different types of crazy things that have happened throughout history. Race conditions were caused, blackouts were caused, basically due to this like memory management issue. So like if you if if you're looking for some context, practically use security is one of them. Real world applications where things blow up, all different <laughs> types of things. Yes. It's, yeah, you want to have something that's really fast, but you also don't want to have something that leaks everywhere. Yes, and that's where Rust comes in. So what Rust yeah. does is by its, by its compiler, it forces the code to be memory safe. You literally can't write code with all the memory leaks and bugs of C++. It will, will not compile unless okay. you specifically tell it that, that I am writing unsafe code. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I was having you, you can do that, but... But you know it's unsafe. You don't know that as C plus plus. You just write something in and it explodes your rocket. Yeah, I'm gonna try to find the exact, uh, exact scenario. But I remember, I believe it was a Brazilian launch. It was crazy. Yeah, get, you know, the exact article. I'm trying to Brazil rocket crash. I mean, yeah, I I, I remember like looking into a lot of what the interviewers are looking for and it's basically like oh, do you know about money memory management i'm um, like okay it was called the no. vls-1 vo3 rocket crash okay and that's that yeah okay that's a little context for you yeah yo okay so what we wanted to do is adam and have you be the uh, the big uh you know the test case and oh boy. Uh, we, <laughs> okay, we both have installed Rust. We want to install Rust on your machine. Okay, uh, I don't know. How I'm gonna do that. I don't have multiple screens. Don't have the ability. Um, okay. Well, let's see. So, what we we're gonna do today was we we're gonna install Rust. We're gonna talk about strings, something like a, just like a very primitive data type. We're going to see what are like, you know, some of the stuff that you get actually with the native standard library when it comes to strings. And then we're going to delve in to what it means for a string versus a STR, which is very important in Rust. We're going to move on to once we have, you know, like a slice of different uh, characters inside that string, we're going to basically talk about iterators in Rust. And then we're going to end on testing. Okay, there's a Wikipedia page here. Okay. It's called, the, it's called the List of Software Bugs. And it's got like all these tragic incidences <laughs> of, of memory issues. Uh, no, no. It's pretty funny. I don't know where I should post it. Or you post it in the... Uh... The private chat so we can... Yeah, yeah. put it in the chat and then we'll, we'll, we'll post it on, uh, on stream. Okay. So we got more people watching. Welcome. If you guys are just tuning in, we're going to be doing an intro on Rust, and we're really excited. Uh, so let's just see. Uh, can we fake install Rust again? Hmm. You, wait, do you want me to see if I can accomplish this task? You don't yeah. have to. We, I, I'll just pretend like I never installed Rust, and I'll go through it again. Open up a VMware box, baby. Or start a new uh, Linux thing on uh, WSL, straight up. Okay, well, let's see. I have my screen ready. Let's just check it out. We're going to do this real quick. Download like a, download a different version of Ubuntu. Show them how to install that. I don't want to do that. Yeah, that, okay. would, that would just take a while, and we'd be kind of like... Oh, it'd be horrible. It takes, takes like two minutes. All right, so I have VS Code running here real quick. I got it. So let's see. Right. So we're going to pretend like I didn't install that. And what I did was is that I went to rustlang.org here. 
rustlang.org tools install. And really, I'm running Linux, so I'll be able to immediately pipe it to my shell. So it looks like a curl command, it's making sure that it's secure, and then we'll pipe uh, this rust file to my shell. Download the installer. Can you explain what a curl is real quick? Curl is a program used to download remote files. So you can curl and, you know, uh, a browser, when you point it to a website, will be, is basically doing the same thing, but it's also getting a bunch of other files and graphics. This is a command line utility, so we can immediately just grab this file from this website and then we use the the pipe command to make sure that plain, that standard input goes to the shell and then starts our install installer nice could you run a curl uh cheat.sh or show them another example real quick no we have to concentrate go yeah. <laughs> so let's just see uh rust up is basically what this is called you can see it's installing into my home directory stable profile it's going to modify my path URL, and i'm going to say proceed with installation and it says to configure your local shell run source cargo.end which basically would you know tell you my my home directory and cargo is the package manager we were talking about and env is the environment and it looks like we're good. So if I make sure that we're in the clear, I'm going to say cargo. All right. And it looks like we have a clean install. Uh, there's, I think that there's a chocolatey installation for Windows. Um, and I believe this, you can use the same one for Mac OS X, but you'll have to check that out. But... I'm going to toss it over to John. So now we've installed it. Let's see. I believe our next thing is to give you the uh, the steering wheel here. Wait, you already installed it? Yeah. Wow. Live. <laughs> no, I did it from I did it I did it from from the top. Mm -hmm. um... Just to give that real quick run back. All I had to do was go to this website here, rustlang.org, tools install. And from here, I got this, pay, you know, curl, proto, HTTPS, making sure that it's secure. It goes right to the Rust website and pipes it to my uh, shell command. So mm. I can... So once you say cargo, it will give you that output. We know it's installed and we're ready to go. So, um, you want to take the drivers? Okay. Um, I can remove and add you to it. Yeah. So, why? How do I not have permission to do that? I don't know, but I do. So let's try it. Cool. Bam. All right. So let's see. My I'm looking at your screen and is, is my mouse screen? here. Okay, that's it's the other window. I was I have two empty VS codes and one of them is being shared. Uh -huh. yeah, 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 yes, that's it. All right, so okay, so we can see this. So let's see what. So how do we want to do this? Let's go. So we're gonna do cargo. So today's lesson, we are going to be reversing a string in Rust. Can you zoom in a little bit? Hit Control Plus. Control Plus. <laughs> Still more? What do you think? More? More? Yeah. yeah, yeah, more. One more. Nice. Okay. Um. So let's go. Let's see, yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Um. Let me make their. So what are you gonna do right now? Stream. CD. Stream, okay. 
Eric, you had to turn up your, you adjusted your sound a little bit. You had to turn up your Maybe. There we go. Or, That's, yeah. Okay. So we're going to, to, to be using Cargo to create a brand new Rust project. Okay. So we're going to do Cargo new reverse. Do we say, do we say Cargo new or Cargo init? There's, there's multiple ways. So if you okay. go to, um, if you just hit cargo, you can go cargo yeah. help. And so you can do, you can do a knit, which creates a new pa cargo package in an existing directory, or you can do new, which creates a new folder with the name of your choice. Okay. So you can do cargo new reverse string. And there it is. There is my Rust. I think you got CD into it. That I do. Cool. So just to, just to cap, get on top, when you did, uh, we created a new directory so we can create a brand new instance or brand, you know, so cargo new. And the name reverse underscore string is the name of our new program because we are. Um, so you get, yeah. you get two nice things. A, um, a, um, it creates its own cargo file, car cargo.toml, which is the Rust equivalent of a package.json. And so if we take, we peep into that, um, it has GitHub. package information, and then it would have dependencies if there were any. But in the in the scope of reversing a string, we're only using what's known as the standard library, which is the most basic set of tools that are included in Rust, which in itself is pretty robust. So, so that's super important because, like we were saying, Rust has a package manager just like Node in the sense that there are third-party modules that you can install right from the command line which is super helpful yes so so you know i think you out, if you if you if you go back are you uh if you go back up one folder and you and you say code space dot it'll reopen a Ooh. windows Oh no no no! Go cancel it. <laughs> okay, let's not do that. <laughs> okay. Interesting. No, when the, yeah, let's not mess with it. I don't know a, how. It's a fickle beast. Um. So what? What is it called? Stream reverse string. There you go. Just open that folder. Okay, here we are. Right. Cool. That's exactly what I wanted. Just. But just it would be code space dot in Ubuntu, and it would just work. Sure. Close whatever that is, man. That's um, okay. that's a whole tool for Arduino, actually. It's pretty cool. That's a, that's a topic for another time. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so uh, I think that we were talking about it, and so we it also gives you a Git ignore. Fun fact. Oh, cool. I didn't. I never even thought about that. That's, That's pretty good. Cool. Yeah, because it looks like target is what happens once you build your project. Everything is in target, correct? Yes. And all the files that you would use for that. Okay, so you ran a brand new one. And now we have main.rust. Yeah. Yes. This is the theme. This is, this the, is the, the hello, hello world of Rust. Okay, since this is the very basic of it, can we. Uh, what I think we did first was just to make sure that we can like run it, build it, and then I mean build it and then run it. And yep. So in the we do the build command, which is cargo build. Sure. And we get a target, and the target contains, let's see, a reverse string binary. Sweet. Which okay. Is this. So then you would say cargo run, right? Yes. And that, and oh, hello, yeah, great, cool. So, 
Yeah, and this, so this this main program is JK. <laughs> hello, we're now, hello, hello, world. now we're Rust programmers. <laughs> yep, twenty minutes and you're you're done. You're ready to go take on the world and re rewrite Google Chrome. <laughs> um, that's cool. So uh, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies that are part of this. And yes. before that, you make sure that if you have a, a certain extension for this because it really did help out. I do have that extension. Can we just that, check it out on the extensions on your left? Yes, and uh, I have not had the luck you have had with it just working. Um, but, so it. if you go to Rust, um, do I have to enable it or? Yeah, it looks like I think uh, hit Control P and do greater than Control P and then hit greater, greater than. No, no, no. The yes. actual symbol. Yeah. Yes. And now let's say, uh, just type in Rust, and we'll see what it gives us. Okay, so start the Rust server. Let's see if that you can do that, because that will give you the. Couldn't you start? Uh, not... Windows. Windows. <laughs> wow. Yes, well, Windows knows that wants me to install the windows version of rust up so i have to install rust twice on windows let's not do that right now no um but okay, eric can back. demonstrate how this works properly in ubuntu we can we can uh let's see what i got here blah 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 this is it. like an absolutely amazing extension i have right. never even used this i've been programming rust for months without ever looking at this so yeah, let's see. Uh, I had this extension. So if I were, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Let's see. I'm going to look up in my recent history. So if I said CD, live stream blockchain center live stream and we'll say i'll do it like you too i'll do a make director we'll call it uh demo rust okay rust so what you said was I can say cargo new demo rust. Can I do it like that? Um yes. Cool, let's see like that. Um it's gonna create a new folder though. Um so go to LS again. Or you can just okay. open it. Okay. All right, cool. Bam. So I got your git ignore just like you. And what was super cool was when I opened up my main.rust, I get this, and I get a lot of helpful hints when it comes to. So if I like uh, what we were talking about before, we're talking about strings, right? Yes. So let me just just give you an example of what you can get out of that extension. It's super cool. So if I said, I'm going to just make a string like that, and we'll just say string, and we can immediately start seeing that we have a lot of control over what is being displayed. So if I said string and I and I went over it, then it actually gives me a lot of great examples. So we are talking about this class called string, which comes from the standard library, and we're going to be, you know, using from. So we'll be able to actually define it here. But there are two critical things that we're looking at, and it is uh, 
we're talking about mutable strings and immutable strings. Do you want to like talk about that for two seconds? Um, yes. So in Rust, there are basically two very similar string types. Yeah. There is at st or there's str and string. And so str is known as a string slice because it's a fixed slice of uh, characters. Okay. While string is a dynamically growable structure in heap. Um, so that so creating a string allows you and creates um, a data structure that can be appended to. While string is um, well, or str is simply a fixed thing, though they share most of the same methods. So most of what you can do on a string, you can do on a str, I guess, or str. a. A slice, a string slice. Yeah. Okay. So we got here. We have a string, and it's uh, basically a, a mutable file. I think that something that I ran into before too is that you can actually say mutable s, but it actually told me is like it doesn't really need to be mutable because uh, when you just declare a variable like that, then it is unused mutable on by default. Which is another reason why this plugin is so crucial is that it has so many helpers just right there. That you don't really get, but since we don't need that right now, we can I'm save. I'll say cargo build because I haven't done that yet. What? Um, what? LS. No, I got it. No, you have to go one folder deeper because it created a demo Rust folder in your demo Rust folder. Now, Cargo. Oh, no. Okay. Well, then. Cargo, uh, build. try it. It's not looking at the right one. It it definitely should be because you're in. Um... No, I have a brand new window open. Let's see. Let stop sharing my screen. Let's do a different screen. Um, I can just go back to my screen. Or how about now? Yeah, we're good. Cargo build. Cool. 38, 1.388 seconds. Does that look good, guys? There we go. Cargo run. Darn. All right, cool. So we did this something really, really basic, and I just printed out that. But it really gives us like a good sense of what string is and how we're going to uh, use it. Uh, Rust style formatting strings here in the print statement. It's super down low, but very primitive, but very necessary. Let's see. I think that what we're going to talk about next is since we, do uh, you want to take it for the iterator? Yeah, but we're. I'm going to start a bit more basic than that. So uh, can you go to my screen? Because I do not have the ability. Okay. To... All right, you're allowed, okay. You're up. So we are at writing a function to reverse a string. But first, we have to go into a little bit about what is a function, or how, how does a function in Rust work? OK. And like so all this functions, is as it were. It takes an input and an output. So our input variable is s, and s is of type string slice. But we have this nice ampersand um, symbol here. Now, what does that mean? And what that means, it's called a in Rust, it's called a reference. And okay. and this is one of the most important ways Rust is memory safe. In that, so all object when an object or a variable in Rust is used, meaning sent to a function, 
it destroys immediately the variable in memory. Okay. So if, you, if you print like that string, you won't be able to use it afterwards. Cool. So, so when when a function takes a reference, that means it can take a variable without destroying it in memory, and it can be used in other places. Which, okay. and the reason I'm using a string slice is because is because um, that way I don't have to define something as a string. I don't have to use string from. I can just just give it the text immediately. Like so except if you were to call it. Yes, this hello world type is a string slice. Yeah. And that's by default all text or text characters in quotes and Rust default to that. So I don't have to do string from blank blank each time I, I give this. Cool. So the arrows here specify the return type, which is going to be string. Right. Hey, yeah. For everyone who are just, uh, I can see we're, we're getting an influx of uh, users watching. What are you, are you watching YouTube right now, or? No, I'm looking at the stream and we're getting more people in. I just want to just remind everybody today we're doing Rust, and right now we are going through not just primitive data types, but we're writing a function right now, and we are now going over. Uh, I think we, since we are going through streams now, we're looks like we're going through uh, the concept of iterators. Yes. Okay. So uh, something that we talked a lot about is you know different paradigms of data safe methods. We're talking about uh, you know functional styles and basically the adverseness of writing for loops and what we're trying to do to, to, to not do that. And I think that really what that means for us is that we have a we have a string of characters S coming in, right? And we want to be able to iterate through all of them. So we're passing that through to cars, correct? <laughs> yes. And cars or cares is a built-in function in the string method. Okay, before we actually start writing the, mm -hmm. the string function, why don't we uh, why don't we call it from main and make sure that it can be passed? So maybe just return s at the moment. Okay. And what one of the things I really like about Rust it is it has the simplest return statements. So that just returns s. Okay. So what if so can we call it right now? Can we define a string and call it and then call it? Yes. Because I don't want to get too ahead, because now we're going to start fixing the problem, going on now what it is again. So, we have reverse string. Hello. Okay. So, we're, we're literally bringing in... So can we do a cargo build and run on that? Is, ooh, error. That's fun. Oh yes, yeah, so you have to do a two string. Oh, because it's returning a string and not a slice of string. Yes, if you want to do that. Ah, okay, we got a warning. And okay. hello, hello. Let's see what the warning is. Um, yeah, it's it doesn't like our name SSS. Um, so yeah. you could do something simpler like S, yeah. or maybe yeah. go for some underscore action here. I wonder if it, let's see if it likes that more. No warning. Great, cool. So, there's, so, so what did we learn? To yeah, convert a string slice to a string, there is a two-string method. Okay. So. Something that I wanted to do in parallel here, and I think is like another thing great for, I, I guess, Dev Wednesdays, is that hey, we always want, to, yeah, we want to write it. We want to do best practices. And we want to. So, 
writing tests is super important, especially at this really low level. And we don't have reverse string as a function written yet, although we're going to rely on it. So the perfect way to start writing this is to actually create our test to fail until we have it correct. Indeed. So, okay. That's so, interesting. You started already. And something that I learned and was thought it was really cool was that you can write the unit test directly inside of the same file. Like yes, that's a hashtag square bracket test is all you need to let the the actual testing software to let you know that that this is a test function. So can we just like return nothing? Um, we can print. We can just print something. Yeah. This is my test. It does nothing. Sweet. So can we like do yep. a? So we can do a test. cargo test, which is the very complex way of running tests. So it says that it actually picked it up. So that all you needed to run the test was that it picked up the, the hashtag test. <laughs> it passed with OK because there is no real assertions or anything really being questioned. Um, so what we want to do is that since we don't have to import it, we have reverse string literally inside mm -hmm. of the first thing to mention is Rust, the standard library, includes its own testing software. Yes. Which is very cool. Um, and you have you have assert equals, and there's also an assert not equals. Yes, um, NE. I, on NE. I would think NE. Yeah. Let's, actually, let's try to assert NE. I'm not sure if that's the exact name, but you could do hello. And, See, that's why you got to get that auto complete. It's so good. Yes, that's why I need to get Ubuntu on this desktop somehow. Um, okay, so let, let's just go back to equals because that's fine. We can do print. Uh, so for those following at home, um, assertions are super important for when you're you know you're creating a a test because really when you're saying assertion, you're basically we know that we want this function to reverse. The string that we give to it so really what really you don't want to say that you want to say o l l e h uh, yes but not, not a different language <laughs> so okay let's just pause here and look at it so can we get both of the functions on screen just scroll up a little bit cool so we're we're we want to develop a function called reverse string for our main function. So before, right now, it actually doesn't do anything. So we are creating a test that we know what the output should be. And if we save it and then run our test now, it says what? Test fail. Which is actually a really good thing because now we can actually develop our reverse string method. And then once our tests pass, and we have our new feature. Yes. So, so, so let's go. Let's go for. Uh, so if we say, so you started already. Now let's just go back into our thoughts and mm -hmm. let's reverse the string. Okay. And so that's where where we get into the concept of iterators in Rust. Okay which are built in functions that um, go through an array. They will iterate one by one from the start to finish from a, um, essentially an array of uh, data. Yeah, so but the we do not, slice. We, so do not have, we do it's... not have an array of data, we have a string slice. So what do we do? Well, we have, Rust has a built-in function that applies to both type string and string slice called cares or cars. Um, cares. I can say cares because it's a okay. character. Chars. Char chars. Or chars. Anyway. Char did you say this is a character? No, it's a character. You say char, I right? guess. Um, cares. cares. Okay. So who cares? 
Who cares? Oh, all right. Let's keep... Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, yeah, so everyone listening at home, we are breaking new ground here. <laughs> so, so S is coming in. It's our string slice. Mm -hmm. And so, when it, once you do this function, now we have an iterator. Yeah. So it's much like the the, the functional aspect, the new functional ES6 stuff that comes out of JavaScript. You know, like we're going to, if you're familiar with Node or uh, JavaScript, then you can immediately have that dot notation to iterate off of you know everything instead of building a for loop and an index and basically causing a nightmare of uh, you know for 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 or your heap because you know a, a for loop is actually really problematic because it'll actually have to paginate and keep track of how deep your iterations are therefore you know changing the state of what's going on instead of saying okay i know exactly from the kernel how many things are inside of this and then i'm going to iterate for you so it's great is this another yes. while wow loop do well wow loop argument here depth to which you can go <laughs> with literally we're, we are literally still there still talking <laughs> about what uh, do uh, yeah, functional whatever. programming well, yeah <laughs> Like, no, <laughs> spaghetti code no, <laughs> no but the, the depth you can go in that, that rust offers with iterators there's at least two to three dozen methods that you can pretty much do anything you can imagine so let's just uh so what i think that another method right off of cares is reverse but, yeah but we're going to use we're going to go the simple route and we're going to use reverse so he um, and so this reverses the order of the iterator. So instead of starting at H in the array of characters, you're going to start at O. Oh, yeah. And then and start. So the important thing to note to note about iterators is they are lazy. Mm -hmm. at, and which means this by itself does not do anything. So if you define let if you define let s equals this and then and then try to return that you would just get like an iterator object yeah you wouldn't be able to get anything because it that's you, where it would give so you nothing if you actually, actually render it to that or cast it to that type then you would have to use a uh, collect that's the one we learned yes so another one is next if i wanted so if i were uh, okay yeah so i could get the the first so get, or, or last get, object by calling next. Mm -hmm. um, and if Eric were to share his screen, his nice um, oh, highlight see it? plugin, okay. yeah, it would Let's tell see. you everything about next. Here, um, I took yours off. Let me put mine on real quick. Bing. So if I said the same thing, s dot. Yeah, I have access to all of them, so I can be like, I can do add. So we'll, yeah, we'll just go all the way down, show everyone the ridiculousness of it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do. You can do your string as bytes, string as a mutable pointer, as a vector, mm -hmm. as a mutable string, as a reference. You can have bytes capacity. So but who cares? Or who just cares? Clear, so. clone, contains, very useful. Uh, equals, escape, so many different things that we can do. Find that's super important, so we can do that quickly from there. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that's built into this already. We can go right to box bytes, get the length, get all the lines, uppercase, so many things. We can do uh, pop, push, repeat, remove, place. But let's just go to cares, and then we can see that we. From cares, it has a bunch of methods too. We have okay, we want all, any, by reference, chain, copy, count, cycle, and you know, we're getting a lot of the other functional the filter, filter, map, find, flatten for each, which is another one. So let's, let's go back to you, back to me, yeah, okay. But we don't have to do any of those crazy methods because we have collect. We don't, and we're back to you. Okay, so and what collect does 
is it goes one by one through the iterator and returns it to its native array state. Okay. Um, and there's, there's a very nice precise definition in the Rust docs, which we will show you afterwards because it's one of the most important things to understanding any of, to coding in Rust is understanding the documentation. Oh yeah. Because there's three dozen um, iterator functions and you need to know what they are. Mm -hmm. um, no pound include for all these methods? <laughs> pound? What do you mean? Yeah, like hashtag include. Like, well, we don't have to, a lot of things you would have to do that once we get into like yeah but I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm seeing these methods all these methods are standard you don't have to include like the math library and all that for all this no, stuff right we're going no, yeah that's what we're just talking about these their basics. Libraries are just there done so interesting interesting fact is that one of the issues collect actually has though is getting the data type um in I'm using Rust 1.44 and Rust 1. I think it was 3.8. I had to do this. Oh, so you had to actually bring it. And tell I, had to, it. I had to tell it it was a string because it it wouldn't. It would have. It had some problems, and you had to use that very weird syntax. Let's see. Did I collect? No, just okay. get rid of it. You don't need to do it. Don't do it. No, but. That's the other thing about the, the Rust live thing. It will tell you literally will, what's done. Yeah, the compiler will tell you. Compiler is like God in Rust. It, it knows all. Yeah. So can, so you said it built, but can you do cargo test? Let's see. That will say, okay, is it actually reversed? Yes. And we can... It has passed. Cargo and then, run. Wow. Ole. That is, that is groundbreaking. <laughs> no, that's a really big thing. Uh, that's that's huge. Because once you do that, then I think we're at a really good place with that. I don't know how I feel, but I don't see any for loops in here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Functional programming. Ouch. 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 Yeah. The it other, cool, it. The other cool thing about iterators is they're also faster than using a for loop. Yes. So it's always faster in Rust to use an iterator. Um, For sure. I'm just, I'm just joking, by the way. Uh, Eric and I have this ongoing debate about it while, while loops and how they should never debate. be, <laughs> they, they should never be, be like used. Like <laughs> it's just basically me preaching the gospel and you. Allowing Dude, I'm a heretic. It's all right. It's all right. Like, why would I try to build my computer fast? <laughs> <laughs> the world was made in seven days. <laughs> All right. Yeah, there's a lot of C plus plus dads who are angry at, at this. And you know what? Good for them. God we'll keep bless them alive. Them. Get nice and angry. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Okay. So, this is something <clears throat> that I'm not. I downloaded a native debugger based on LLDB. Or debugging Rust con Rust, which I thought was super important for us to cover. I was following along here. Let me save it and see if I can actually save. Yeah, I know. Cargo. It'd be a great tutorial to figure out how this work, how to get this to work in Windows. Yeah, well, that is not my job. <laughs> for it to get the Windows, would be like uninstall Windows. Step one. That's really interesting. Like the plugin actually has the run test right underneath the hashtag test. So I can just run that test from here. That's wild. Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah, that's really intense. Um, so 
that actually uh let me let me see i'm gonna try to i'm gonna like as if i didn't do it before i'm gonna go to now that i've installed this for my extensions lldb Let's see that Let's see, debugging on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows, so you should be able to get it. Conditional breakpoints, functional breakpoints, data breakpoints, and log points. Python, Rust language support, built-in visualizers for vectors, strings, and other data types. Reverse debugging for experimental, blah, blah. <clears throat> okay, so I can either create a, a really quick debugger session, but what I found out was when I started my installation here and I said I want to create a JSON file it's asking me right now for me to start uh, an LLDB environment and what actually it does is that it looks at that uh, Tomo file it detects it and I say yes I don't think you saw that but really what this did was that it recognized that I have a development environment set up for unit tests and a regular executable which this is amazing because I didn't have to do this myself this is one of the bigger issues that I have when I'm working with the new project just to make sure that I know how to debug with it and set it up and it's really nice that it does that with me or for me you can see it created these two different profiles here so I can debug the actual so let me bring up both at the same time. This is really cool because it's asking me I can debug the actual executable within the main or debug the unit tests. Uh, I'm not going to really care. I'm going to set a breakpoint right here in the middle. And we're going to run it. And we're going to see if it works. Great. Okay. So we're seeing here. Let me close this. Close this. And let's expand this a lot. And let's just make this more visible. So you can, you can do a lot from just the debugger work inside of VS Code. So you can see that S is exactly what we were talking about. And it is, you know, a great example of what this data type is. You can see that this raw representation is Alex string string. And we are getting, uh, you know, I have what what here. So I get W-H-A-T, W-H-A-T. Interesting. So you immediately have the ability to start taking your code to the next level because all of a sudden we can write a test and we can start debugging right from VS Code. And these these are available immediately from the extension store. So that was what I was saying. If you're, going, if you're following along at home, get LLDB and it actually does a lot for you when you go to create your... You can see that when you are creating a new thing, it's in launch.json within VS Code here. See, we got a debug console that's coming right off of that. We also have the terminal command here. And we can actually use the, the native that this is getting blocked out. But you can see that you can step over your function. So we can say we're back inside of the normal code and we have the actual explanation of what's going on here, which is super tight. You can actually step in and actually see what's going on directly on the, uh, the bytecode level. Wow. <laughs> That's just, are those hexadecimals? <laughs> yes, they are. But if you actually are interested in diving deeper, you can see like, you know, uh, very explicitly where the heap is and where the stack is. And you can cache your stack the best. That is 
what we wanted to talk about. I think if yes. we wanted to go back from the top, we learned how to install Rust. We spoke a lot about uh, primitives that are strings, more specifically, and we figured out, and actually from our actual debugger here, explicitly what the actual raw string looks like. Yes. So one thing I want to say that sure. I just figured out that's really, really cool, and I completely ignored this for way too long, is the cargo search method. Okay, you, you, want, you want the screen? Um, no, Eric, you can do it. it. I don't need the screen for it. But if you do cargo search, um, try it. Stop this. It's pretty amazing. So do cargo search um, primes. Primes? Yeah. As in prime numbers. And here's all, it will give you a list of packages for your search. <clears throat> and that's um, honestly kind of amazing. It's beautiful. Like, and then yeah, all you, you don't need a browser. You don't have to go on the internet. You don't have to skim through GitHub. That's really cool. Um, and if you copy primes equal, if you copy that first line exactly, it's just a cheat sheet straight up. No, go into cargo.toml. Um, you say cargo what? Your ca cargo.toml file. No, open it, right? Yeah, yeah, you open it. Open your cargo.toml. Um, and then paste that under dependencies. Yep. And now you've installed Primes, li a Prime library. <laughs> nice. Locking, waiting for file lock on package cache lock. Hmm. Interesting. Do I delete cache lock? I don't know. It, it didn't delete it. Delete it. Oh boy, I think I broke it. Ooh. The lock. <coughs> Interesting. Um, weird. Maybe I'll destroy target. Oh, there it is. It's gone. And yeah, you, now you installed a prime library. Nice. Famous. All right. That's just that's a, that's awesome. Like the ease of it, finding and installing libraries. You don't have to leave VS Code. No, and you don't have to really VS Code, honestly, to run this test. That is so dope. Look at that, right? I just thought that was super nice. Just being able to run one test just by clicking it. Wow. Okay. Wow. Course correction, the rocket that I was mentioning earlier, the Ariane 5 with the European Space Agency, a a agency oh my gosh, and it returned an operand error because it switched from double float to float and had no memory allocation. Anyways, uh, I, are we pretty much done here, guys, with this this segment? Or? Yeah, we, yeah. We, we yeah, actually we, perfect time. Nice. Well, yeah, we devised this to be short and simple. And so got it. on my screen here, I'm putting it up. Let me uh, switch over. Eric, how do That's I do me. that? How do I get this up here? OK, so if everybody can see this, this book right here is something John recommended to me, and I started paging through it. Um, and uh, it is written by who? The guys that wrote the Rust programming language, John? Um, probably. I don't. I actually don't know who those guys are. But. Anyways, this book gives you a bunch of walkthroughs. If you guys are curious about, uh, you know, Rust, it's a really good book to start playing around with. It'll teach you a lot of different stuff. I know uh, there's a lot of different use cases which we discussed. A lot of different benefits. You know, the fact that it has a package manager, which is incredible, and. Um, I mean, n numerous benefits. If you're in the blockchain space, it's capabilities. You know, we talked about it last week with, uh, you know, just basically having the ability to, uh, you know, operate in WebAssembly and uh, the number of blockchains that are currently being written in it. John, can you give us a little stat 
about that real quick. What, how many would you say most blockchain projects that are moving forward are trying to move to Rust? Is that the reality? Um, I I can't give you numbers. I could list off some of the block impressive blockchains. Um, but yeah, I could definitely say most. Some of the most like most prominent ones would be Libra, Grin, Near.ai, Space yeah. Nest. Um, well, there's the whole inner Polkadot and Substrate, which is its own ecosystem, is essentially based around Rust. Nice. Yeah, but, so we, we, last, week, last week we did a whole segment on Dino, which has uh, native Rust bindings. Nice. So you can see that uh, really what I think that we're trying to get at with these specials is too is that yes we are interested in rust it is being part of like the larger web vocabulary but also a really big portion of like the new stacks that are going to be coming out and that we are going to be using for especially in this space yeah near native speeds in your browser which is john, what john was saying some people are compiling entire games in their browser which is operating at near native speeds, meaning that if you're going to open an app on your desktop or in your browser, it would operate in the same, basic yeah. same, same way, um, at, like with minimal performance loss, which is incredible. So um, it might get to the point where you're running an operating system inside of our operating system, like on Chrome OS, could have its own, like you know, more extensive. Right, guys? Is that the reality? Is where we're going? Yeah, and then there's applications like being high frames per second on a you know, a 3D program that you don't have to install. I mean, that is the reason why web apps are extremely viable is because you can write a program and you don't have to you know, go through the arduous process of installing it. It's like ready to use immediately. Uh, you know, stuff like WebAssembly is allowing to have like, you know, whole games being developed and that's why we're here. Awesome. Well, any final thoughts from everybody? I know uh, I'm, I'm pretty pretty stoked on what you guys are doing you taught me a lot about it i didn't know you run uh task scripts right in the main code file like that so That's i honestly just figured that out as we were doing that i was like run test what do you mean what do you mean wow um i'm most excited about the vs code like <laughs> yeah because actually when i was learning when i was doing my initial test when i was like running uh the scripts uh it was, you know, the, the compiler is actually giving me a lot of clues on what is actually wrong. So, like, you know, when I was learning the difference between, uh, you know, string slices and string objects as a class, it was telling me, hey, that doesn't look like you need to do that. <laughs> but yeah, and we're going to like if I just pull my screen up right now. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Yeah, so like if if I did something wrong, let's see, where is my VS Code? Okay, if I'm doing something wrong, then I can know about it immediately. So if I like, for instance, didn't return anything, then I am, you know, let's see. It really immediately tell me right here. They're like this is actually what's going on. Let's see. Um, yeah. So basically, this is telling me right now that I'm not returning anything correctly. Or if it is, then it, where it is it? Nice. So, Bugging tools are the shit. VS Code has come a long way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man, that's really cool stuff. So. You know, Eric, I would like to, you know, moving forward, what are we going to be looking at doing with Rust? I guess is like, what do you, what do you have on the agenda moving forward? I'm um, thinking, I'm thinking that there's like, there are smart contract availability, uh, development uh, possibilities. Uh, I, I was helping John uh, debug one of his games that he was writing, and uh, that would be really uh, a blast to do on stream. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff, uh, just like the lower level, like systemic stuff that we want to have running extremely quick. And, you know, we're going to, I'm going to try to like, you know, in my new projects to write it first there, because, you know, whether you're doing like 
you know, a game or like maybe some like some sort of maybe like a some sort of analytics driven process, maybe even like event listeners for uh, a, any type of chain that we would I would try to like put forward that first. Not that I don't I fell out of love with like uh, Node or Python, but there's just something to be said about. What about running like on an Arduino or something like that? Um, that's a work in progress. Yeah, it's definitely actually, doable. It's just not the. I don't think Arduino, their cores are. It is open source, but the actual wrappers for C plus plus are not. I, from what I understand, oh, okay. um, people have done it. There's a whole awesome Git repo about embedded Rust. Okay. Um, nice. Yeah, we can do that. It's yeah, just like, not um, simple. Yeah, it's like that, it's rabbit hole. I'd like to, when we're all together, maybe play some IoT stuff like that. That'd be really cool. Oh yeah, um, no, at I'm some old. point in time in the future. And then the other thing, Eric, is uh, when we're moving forward, I'd definitely like to see like a, a rundown of your your build kits because you have like the best with Ranger and Zish and like uh, oh, just like just our dev environment. Yeah, just yeah. straight yeah. straight command lines. Uh, we should definitely go through it because you have all those cool things. Talk about cheat sheet, curl cheat sheet. It's pretty good. And yeah, then now, uh now it's the stuff to talk about. Yeah, so we'll be pro uh scheduling them moving forward, guys. That's all we got for tonight. These two guys, thank you so much for putting the time in. I appreciate you coming back with you know how to you know test and, and reverse a string. That was pretty interesting. Uh learned a lot of stuff today. Mm. That's about it. Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in and see you next week. Bye. Bye.